Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Author Zana Myers wants to remind us all that God is always present in our lives. In her new book, The Harvest is Coming. And the audiobook edition just came out, and we're going to talk all about this. The author, Zana, is here with me now. Zana, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. I'm all curious about The Harvest is Coming and what readers and audiobook listeners are going to find here. Can you tell me all about it? Okay, well, my book is about some visual and spiritual encounters and meetings with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as well as with angels. And I was pretty much directed or compelled to write this story from one of the angels that I had actually spoken to me in one of my dreams. So that's kind of where this started from. And then it just exploded after there because I've had multiple encounters. So I felt that this really needed to get out there, get the word out there to the word about our Lord and Savior. Did you have specific readers in mind for this? No, actually, of all people, it is a super easy to read book. It's not as difficult to read. It doesn't have any big words in it. It doesn't have any big sentences. It is a quick read for all people, all genres. And what sparked you to write this, Zana? What gave you the idea you got to write your story and tell the world? Actually, it was an encounter with one of the angels that really compelled me to spread the word. That's what I was directed to do. And, you know, sometimes when you're told to do things, you honestly, you got to do them. I am not going against anything that I believe came directed from the Lord. I was blessed with that, good, bad, or whatever. I felt that that was what I needed to do. And what does your writing background look like, Zona? Have you ever done anything like this before? Not in a published book. I have done small articles for work and for work magazines and work websites, but nothing on this scale, so to speak. So once you started off on this, writing it, publishing it, everything, was this a really long time for you? It did take me a while. Because honestly, at that time, I didn't have a functional computer. So I was handwriting everything over and over and rewriting it and rewriting. And that actually took me uh, yes, a while to do. But now I have a functional computer. <laughs> I'm much, <laughs> much quicker at doing this than I was before. And then after all that time and that hard work that you put into it, that day comes and you finally get that first copy in. You get to hold the harvest is coming. Uh, what's that like? It was exciting, but it was scary also that I actually did it, but I wasn't sure how readers and my friends and family were going to actually receive this and what they were actually going to think. I've been telling them about it, but it's different when you actually have it in your hands, concrete evidence that you got this far. And some of them have accepted and some of them just kind of, they just kind of shrugged me off. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure, thanks, good job, and so on. But I was very proud of the fact that I did that. It took a while and perseverance and courage, and I did it. Yeah, you should be proud. And we're talking about the audiobook edition, and all that time when you were writing it and working on this, you were used to reading your words off the page, and now somebody is reading your own book back to you. So, Zana, what's that like? It's different. Almost simple. Well, I can't believe it. It's like, is this real? <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't, like, fully sunk in yet at all. It's just, hmm. Okay. It's still a little scary to me, but I'm glad I did it. And I hope and pray that this goes out to more people so that they understand that God is real and our Lord and Savior is real. And we honestly just need to get the word out. And that's the whole purpose. That's the whole goal of this. It wasn't for any kind of fame or fortune or money or anything. That had nothing to do with it. I was directed to do this, and that's what I did. And now when you say to yourself, you know, hey, I'm a published author now, Zana, what's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? That it was actually published, that people will actually hear my story if they so choose. And even if one person reads it and one person believes that I'm successful, like, again, it doesn't matter to me, fame, fortune, or money, anything involved, that does not matter. It's the fact that I actually got it published. 
I love the message of this book. I think so many lives are going to be blessed by it. Again, it's titled The Harvest is Coming. This is written by Zana Myers and is published by the Audiobook Network. So go to wherever you usually pick up your audiobooks and you'll be able to get it, like Audible and iTunes and Amazon. Zana, it's been fantastic talking with you tonight. Thanks so much again for coming on the show. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much for, for having me, and I greatly appreciate this opportunity to share the word with you and with everybody, and I appreciate you taking your time for me. This is the story of a high-profile criminal case that may have more to it than meets the eye. It's in the new book written by Julia Stifiori, and it's titled Assigned Counsel. I get to find out all about this book. Julius, the author, is here with me now. Julius, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. I'm excited to learn all about Assigned Counsel. Julius, can you tell me about this? Sure. Assigned Counsel, uh, as you just mentioned, is a book about an attorney who is assigned a very unpopular case, and it's about his trials and tribulations, for want of a better word in investigating the case, defending his client, learning more about what's going on, dealing with the court system, an overzealous prosecutor, and trying to resolve the case in a just manner. It arose out of my colleagues and I over the years just trading stories about our own experiences. And at the end of the conversation, somebody always said, you know, somebody ought to write this down. (laughs) And I decided to write it down. And I'm glad it's out there now. Have you ever done anything like this before, Julius, or is this your first time? No, this is my first attempt. This is my first attempt. Congratulations. What sorts of readers do you think would be really into this? Well, I think people who are interested in mysteries would enjoy it. I think attorneys and people associated with the legal system would enjoy it. And I just think people who are generally interested in drama, courtroom dramas, would enjoy this type of book. You know, it's not exactly Perry Mason, but I think it gives Perry a run for his money. Mm. Well, being your first book, did this take you a long time to write and publish and everything? Yes, it did. I actually started the book, oh boy, about maybe about 10 years ago. I was actually recovering from surgery, and I said to myself, you know, maybe now's the time to, to get that idea down on paper. And, you know, it went through several rewrites on my own. Well, you know, shopping it around to publishers, you know, took a long time. And here we are. So, yeah, I would say the whole process, yeah, it took about 10 years. Yeah, there's the whole writing of the book, but then you have the whole publishing of the book, and that's a whole different ball game. Oh, yeah. Julius, what do you find the most challenging part about that publishing process? The most challenging part that I found was really learning about what the publisher does in the editing process and in putting the book together. I just figured, you know, they would, you know, stick commas and correct spelling and things like that. But, you know, there's also a collaborative process where they, you know, maybe suggest a different turn of phrase. Maybe they ask why I put a particular phrase in there and the back and forth with the editing process. That really opened my eyes. I wasn't expecting that, but I found it to be very productive and I found it to be a good learning experience. If I ever attempt this again, I have it in the back of my head. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you next. Do you think you'll be writing more, maybe a follow-up to this or something else? Well, I have a couple of, you know, people have suggested, people who have read the book have suggested ideas to me. I have a couple of ideas floating around. Again, it's, uh, I don't want to have another surgery to have to, <laughs> to have to start writing. But I think, you know, one of these days, I just may hit the laptop and start putting some words down on paper. And now that you're officially a published author, what would you say is the most rewarding thing about that for you? The most rewarding thing is having people read the book and enjoy it. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from it. I mean, that's the whole reason why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for several reasons. One was to share my experiences of practicing law with the public. I mean, the case is fictionalized, but it's drawn on my experiences, my friends' experiences, you know, and things like that. And also to sort of educate the public on what goes on in the criminal justice system. You know, a lot of what we know about that comes from what we see on TV, what we read in the newspapers. It's not wholly, you know, what really goes on. I understand, you know, a TV show has to add a little drama because they want people to watch. I understand, you know, news reports add a little drama because they want people to read. But I wanted people to see what actually goes on in the courtroom. It's a lot of work that leads up to the trial. It's a lot of work in the trial. 
And also, I would notice that the judicial branch of government is the one that's the most accessible to the general public, but it's the one the general public knows the least about. And I think if I can give them an insight into what actually goes on in the courtroom before the trial, after the trial, I think I'm also giving people a better understanding of how the court system works. Well, the book sounds really exciting. I think a lot of readers are going to love it. Again, it's titled Assigned Counsel. It's written by Julius DeFiori and published by Newman Springs Publishing, so you can find it anywhere. Really head over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, also traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this up. Absolutely. Now, Julius, thank you so much for your time telling me all about Assigned Counsel and everything. It was really nice chatting tonight. Thank you. It was very nice talking to you, too. I appreciate it. Author Heather Helene's new book, it's titled Peace Within, A Journey Through Chronic Illness and Finding Peace Through the Pain. It's an empowering memoir. And we're going to be talking all about this right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Heather, is with me. Heather, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here with me tonight. Hey, Corey. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. I'm excited to be talking with you and to be learning about Peace Within. So, Heather, can you tell me all about Peace Within and what you've written about here? I wrote Peace Within. It talks about my journey through chronic illness when I was diagnosed and kind of how my life just started falling apart, it seemed like. And through all of that, I was just trying to figure out, you know, where did it go wrong and trying to just almost like a puzzle piece, finding those pieces throughout my life through my childhood trauma and through failed marriages. But most importantly, just why did I become so sick? And what I wanted to do was give the readers an ability to see that just because they're going through pain and difficulties and struggles in their life, that they're still capable of pulling through it and knowing that they don't have to give up when they can reach out to their family and support systems. For me, my most important thing was connecting in my relationship back with Jesus and my faith. So I just wanted to give readers an opportunity to be able to see that life is going to give you difficulties, but, you know, you don't have to be afraid and feel like you're drowning in all of that. And I just felt like to make it relatable with everything that I had gone through. And I thought it was an important story to tell. Yeah, I don't imagine it could have been a really easy thing for you to write, sort of reliving a lot of that. So what gave you the idea? What sparked you to write this story and publish it for the world? So I was in the medical field for over 20 years. I was the medical secretary, but the last nine years of my work, I was in medical research and clinical research. And my passion was just to always help people. And 2017 is when my health got really, really bad and my symptoms were just exacerbated. And by April 2018, I could no longer work. My symptoms just got so bad with constantly feeling sick, constantly going to doctor's appointments. And so when I lost my job, you know, being at home and you're stuck in this solitude, <laughs> you're like, okay, how do I cope with this? Because I go from being able to help people on a daily basis to now just being alone in my suffering. And I had to basically come to a meeting with Jesus and just be like, what am I supposed to do now? And I always liked to write. I kind of was always good at it. And then... He was just like, you need to write your story. You need to write about this. And it was a huge struggle for me. And it took me actually a really long time to finish it. I started it in May of 2018. And I didn't finish it until I believe it was, I think, October of 2020, possibly. And yeah, so it was very difficult to have to relive a lot of those pain and trauma and struggles that I had to go through in my life. And again, putting the puzzle pieces together and figuring out, you know, how did these things possibly make me sick? So, yeah, wanting to be able to tell that life experience with other people. I think a lot of people, when they do find themselves struggling in their pain, they feel like they don't want to be a burden to other people. And I went through that a lot myself. Even though, you know, the people that love me so much and they want to take care of me and I have two children and my fiance and they just want to love me and take care of me. But me being so used to taking care of them and now having to take a step back, that was really hard. That was really hard for me to say, OK, I, I need your help. I describe all of that in my book. 
And I describe all of the heartache and the pain of dealing with losing everything, losing my job. I was in car accidents. My finances went to shambles and just very traumatic throughout the process. And even now, I'm still not through it. But I just want to be able to give back to society and give back to people who are struggling like me. I can definitely see a lot of readers finding help and finding hope in this book. Again, the title is Peace Within. A Journey Through Chronic Illness and Finding Peace Through the Pain. It's written by Heather Helene and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So head over to Amazon, head over to Barnes & Noble, get on iTunes, get on the street to your local bookshop. You'll be able to pick it up. Well, Heather, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with me tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. I appreciate you and thank you for inviting me. It's really exciting. Jonathan Schaefer gives insightful perspectives on American societal challenges in his new book, Common Sense for a Broken Serpent and These States United. We'll be talking all about this book right now. The author, Jonathan, is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. And I'm curious about Common Sense for a Broken Serpent. Can you tell me all about this? So, yeah. It's kind of about everyday occurrences, you know, that kind of affect everybody's life. And it's just common sense steps and actions, people in society that would make our life better and how we're losing faith in our society. We're taking God out of our society and we're taking the pride out of being an American out of our society. And it really needs to come back so we can kind of tone down a lot of the stuff that's going on now around the whole country, really. What sorts of readers were you speaking to here, Jonathan? Really, anybody who might just be, you know, looking for, actually, I don't, I, I really don't even know, but I would think anyone that just wants to maybe find God, because I talk about sometimes in my, because we're, I'm a farmer too, so hmm. we have those bad times on the farm where nothing goes right, and you know, you're, you're cursing up a storm, and then you got to say, I can't do this, I got to, you know, you ask God for help, hmm. and he helps you out, he really does. It's stuff like that that I want to get to people and, you know, maybe let them find God or let them come to know him a little bit. So what sparked you to start writing this book? Where did that idea come from, Jonathan? I really have no idea. I just, <laughs> I was taking a shower and I was like, no, no I, I hear about everyone talking about all the stuff that I always talk about. So I want to write a book about it. And I did it and said I was going to do it and checked it off the list. Once you got started on it, how long did this take you? Clear up through the publishing thing and everything. Uh, about two years start to finish. And I never written a book before, so it was my first time. Wow, congratulations. Getting that first one out there, that's, that's such a big deal. Uh, when you finally got that first copy in and got to hold this for the first time, Jonathan, what was that like for you? It was pretty surreal, you know. It's out there, and everyone I let read it or who bought it and said it was great, they said uh, they really enjoyed it, and it opened up their eyes, and I did a good job. Apparently, I'm a good writer. And now you're officially a published author. So, Jonathan, when you think about that, what's the most rewarding aspect of it for you? It's just something I checked off the list, I guess. <laughs> Everything I've done so far in my life has been rewarding to me. So I, I'm a union carpenter by trade, worked all the way up the ladder, amateur paleontologist, made two big dinosaur discoveries out in Montana. Oh, wow. And then from there, I decided to be a farmer. And now we kind of started a pretty successful hay business. So being a published author is just something else I said I was going to do. And when I say I'm going to do something, I you know, put 100% into it and you do it. So you got the writing of the book and you hand that manuscript off. You start that publishing process and there's so much involved in that. Jonathan, whenever you got involved in that publishing end of things, what was the most challenging part of it for you? I guess just making sure everything was as perfect as it could be from the editing to the design I mean, it's a short read. It's a quick read because I'm not really going after people that are real, I don't know how to say, bookworms or people that really read all the time, but just your average person that I can captivate for at least, you know, that maybe a couple of pages. It's not a big book, but enough to keep someone occupied. <laughs> of my stature, I don't really read books, honestly. But if I find a short read like this, I'd pick it up and read it. I'm looking at the book right now. I love the cover. Jonathan, is this something you had in mind the whole way, this design? Yes, I did. And that all comes from Benjamin Franklin. As he, you know, he drew that cartoon. He was a cartoonist, too. Pretty much, if you're not united, you're going to fail. So if you're chopped up like that serpent, 
you're not going to make it in society or your society is going to fail. And so by what I meant is common sense. And for these states united or all the states of the union, that we all got to come together. If we really want to make this country great and we've got to bring God back and it's unity without unity, you're not going to make it. Well, that's an important message. I think a lot of readers are going to be into this book. Again, the title is Common Sense for a Broken Serpent and These States United. This is written by Jonathan Schaefer, published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can grab it up anywhere. Go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. You'll be able to find it. Jonathan, it's been great talking with you tonight. Thanks again for coming on the show. Anytime. It was great. There's a testament of faith and resilience in the new book written by Linda Ketchum Halsey. It's titled, Don't Cry, Mommy, A Search for Profundity, God. And that's the book we're going to be talking all about right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. I'm really happy to welcome the author, Linda, to the show. Linda, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your being here, Linda. Can you tell me all about Don't Cry, Mommy, and what readers can find? Well, I think the book for me is a culmination of 72 years of my life. It's a firsthand account of my journey as a child of God, a daughter, a friend, a wife, a mother, a widow, a doubting Thomas, a grieving parent, and a survivor. A good description is it's a narration of how I have gradually come to terms with being left behind, surviving loss redefining my faith, resurrecting my hope, and just getting on with my life. The main focus, I think, is on my daughter's illnesses and death and how through her faith in God she taught so many others how to stay strong through the gifts of loving and giving to others. The most important takeaway, though, for me that I want people to really take away is how God and His perfect timing through all of these life circumstances that I was dealt sent people in from all walks of life to assist us and met our needs. And there were lots of times like we felt we were going through a hell on earth, but these people and God's timing gave us a glimpse of what heaven must be like for me when you're off of unconditional love and no one asks any questions, they just step up. Linda, what sorts of readers were you writing for here? Well, I think mainly parents who have lost children or anyone who has suffered a loss of life. And I think anyone who has been in search of God or has lost faith in the God they believe in, you know, I think this book crosses all lines for a lot of different people and a lot of different questions like I had all through my journey. So what made you sit down and get started on this, Linda? What gave you the idea to write your story? Well, Carly was our only child. And after she died, I felt like my journey with her shouldn't end there. You know, I felt like I just needed to do something. My friends suggested that maybe writing might help me. You know, that's something that people have always advised others to do. Mm. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I could start writing and maybe even a book or something could come out of that. So I was working full time. So I started just by going through. She had journaled a lot and I had journaled a lot, too. So I started going back through the journals, and then when my friends heard about me thinking about writing a book, they sent me self-help books on how to write a book, and then I started doing research. It took me 10 years since I was working full-time, but initially I just wanted Carly's story to go on and to try to maybe bring some good out of what I had been through, what all of us had gone through. And I could only imagine then what you were thinking, what you were feeling when you finally got to hold this book in your hands for that first time, Linda. What was that like? You know, I cannot, I, when the book arrived, I opened the box and I took that book out and it was just, oh, uh, wow. I, I really couldn't believe my daughter. Had, one of the things, one of the life lessons she had always taught me about was never to let anyone steal your joy. Mm. And when I held that book in my hands, I felt like she and all of the powers that be were telling me, okay, here's some joy for you. I was just so overwhelmed with joy when I finished this. It was just, Amazing. And I give God all the glory. I'm a woman of faith, and I believe my Holy Spirit was my ghost writer through all of this. And yeah, it was just wonderful. It brought some joy back into my life. Now this is out there for the world, Linda. What's the most rewarding thing to you about that? 
I think the most rewarding thing is the responses that I have got from people all over. I've gotten emails, I've gotten phone calls, I've gotten letters about how this book has helped them so much. Just the response of how God is using this book to help others who have walked down the same path I have. What a great book. What a great message. I think readers are going to really get a lot out of this. Again, it's titled, Don't Cry, Mommy, A Search for Profundity, God. It's written by Linda Ketchum Halsey and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can find it in places like Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Linda, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it so much. You have a great evening. Larry Kaufman's new book, All the Hits, All the Time, More Distinctive Rock Memories from the Kaufman Collection. It takes readers through rock and roll history. I'm really excited to be talking about this book. Larry, the author, is right here with me now. Larry, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Corey. I'm very happy to be with you today. I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy to be learning about this book. Uh, Larry, can you tell me all about it? What are readers going to find? Well, for some chapters, I identified trends in the history of rock and roll music. And then I targeted about 25 songs from several of those trends to show how they fit into the category and to give background on the songs and their artists. In the process, I fleshed out some interesting backstories. And there are also some chapters in the book that focus on artists who I think the readers would like to become better acquainted. Who are you writing this for, Larry? Did you have a specific audience in mind? Well, I think the material is ideal for music fans who were listening when the songs were first released. Mm. But younger rock enthusiasts will find it a good way to learn about the rock genre. And along the way, get an understanding, for example, of why their grandpa likes to sit on the porch with his guitar and (laughs) sing songs from the 1960s. It sounds like it was a lot of fun to write. Uh, What sparked this? What gave you the idea to do it? It's the third of a trilogy of books that I've written on the rock genre. After I'd finished the second book, I really didn't have any plans to write another one, but I had a nagging thought in the back of my mind that there might be more material that I could fit into another book. Now, before that first volume came out, what was your background like when it came to writing and publishing? Were you new to it all? No, not exactly. I have a journalism education, and I had about a 10-year career in the newspaper industry. Oh, wow. So you know what you're doing. I'd like to think so. (laughs) (laughs) And when it comes to the publishing end of things, there's so much involved there, Larry. Uh, What did you find the most challenging part about that publishing process? Well, my first two books were self-published, and I had no experience with that going in. So I had to educate myself and suffer a few pratfalls along the way. And I managed to get it done, not just once, but twice. For the third book, I decided to go with a publisher who would do most of that work for me. And what's it like whenever finally after all that time and you're waiting, waiting, and that day comes, you open up your mailbox, and there it finally is, your first copy, you get to actually hold that finished product. What's that like? Well, it definitely was a thrill, Corey. And the book, I think, has a very good cover design, and it's visually appealing to my eyes. So I think the readers will think the same thing, and I hope they get a kick out of reading it, too. I love that you mentioned the cover. It's a great cover. How was that process? Did that all come together pretty well? Yeah, I gave the publisher's graphics department a few uh, ideas about, you know, what was in the book. And the next thing I know, they come out with this design and it kind of knocked my socks off. So now you have these out there. Do you plan on writing and publishing more? Not at this time. In fact, my wife has discouraged me from writing another book because she got tired of hearing me moan and groan when I would encounter production problems. But we'll see. Now, when you think about it, your work's out there, Larry. You're a published author. A lot of your work is actually out there. What's the most rewarding thing to you about that? Without a doubt, knowing that my writing will outlive me and will have a sense of permanence. You know, the printed word has the potential to last for centuries. Now, you have a lot of experience writing. Is writer's block ever a thing you got to deal with? Absolutely. When I was writing this third book, It took me about 22 months, which was a lot longer than I anticipated it taking. And during that time, I was slowed down by illness, surgeries, and writer's block. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's real and it exists. Do you have a strategy, something you do to get through that and start those words going again? No, just sit down and keep plugging at it. Even if on days when I didn't feel like writing, I sat down and I tried to get something done. Before long, the tap was open and things were flowing again. 
We have a lot of aspiring authors listening to us right now, Larry. Is there any advice that you could throw out there for them that they'd find useful? Yeah, Corey, I think so. I would say find a subject that you love and write with all your heart and soul. And make sure it's a labor of love because financial rewards are not guaranteed. Well, this is a really fun book. I think a lot of people are going to be into it, and I definitely recommend that you check it out. Again, it's titled All the Hits, All the Time, More Distinctive Rock Memories from the Kaufman Collection. This is written by Larry Kaufman, published by Newman Springs Publishing. So you can really find it anywhere, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes, also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Larry, it's been wonderful talking with you tonight about all the hits all the time. I had a great time. Thanks again for being here. I really enjoy it, Corey. Thank you. The audiobook edition of the new book by M. Janelle Perkins Muhammad. It's titled Into Me See, Mastering Black Intimacy for the Relationship You've Always Wanted. Well, we're going to be talking all about this right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Janelle, is sitting right here with me. Janelle, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here with me tonight. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. I really appreciate your time. Janelle, can you tell me all about Into Me See and what readers are going to find? Sure. So Into Me See is really about taking that opportunity to look at the cognitive, the emotional, and the spiritual intimacy before you really delve into the physical aspects of intimacy. And that's generally what we think of when we say the word intimacy is the physical side. And I'm challenging people in this book to dig a little deeper, think a little harder about the things that you really want in a relationship, and then connect on those levels before you even consider what the physical will be like. Janelle, did you have specific readers that you were writing for? Actually, I'm kind of writing it for everybody. I had hmm. two audiences in mind. So the first is just the individual who's either thinking about relationship or is actually in relationship, whether that's marriage, a long-term partnership. And then the second was actually for clinicians. So for the first audience, I really am asking them to think about their mental and emotional health, think about their childhood and maybe some of the traumas that have impacted them and created the environment in which they respond to others. So that can be an individual who's thinking about the next relationship or someone who's married. And then for the clinician side, the reason that I wrote so deeply about Black intimacy is because there are some barriers that we faced throughout generations that clinicians really need to be considering as they work with a client through the challenges of building healthy relationships. So what sparked you to get started on this, Janelle? Where did the idea come from? Well, it's interesting because my parents were actually ministers. When I was growing up, they were the pastors over our marriage excellence and our finance ministry. And so interestingly, I saw individuals coming and going on a regular basis seeking counseling, but they always seemed to kind of return for some of the same challenges. And I thought to myself, there has to be more to this understanding than just the spiritual side. So I went back to school so that I could understand the more natural psychological components of how anxiety and depression impact the ways in which we connect. So I got my PhD from Capella University in counseling, education, and supervision for the express purpose of being able to educate others around the emotions that a lot of African Americans were never really taught around the psychology of understanding how mental health impacts relationships. And then also the counseling side so I could do it myself. And then supervising those who are looking to get into counseling in a marriage and family way such that they understand it differently than just making a diagnosis and giving a prescription. Janelle, once you sat down, got started writing this, how long of a journey were you on clear up through the publishing and everything? Yeah, I would say, honestly, because I really do some case study, that it's the 20 years of practice that I've done. Mm. And then when it comes to truly stopping and saying, I have got to get this book out of my system, I went to Africa and sat in Tanzania in three different countries for three months. And I just wrote and wrote and pulled all of the case study together so that I could really have the research behind the premises and principles that I give to everyone. So they then could go back and say, 
this has some sort of validity and evidence base behind it. Mm -hmm. So honestly, almost two years from the time I got to Africa through publishing, but prior to that, a whole 20 years of working with various clients. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are going to be touched and lives are going to be changed by this book. Again, it's titled Into Me See, Mastering Black Intimacy for the Relationship You've Always Wanted. This is written by M. Janelle Perkins Muhammad, published by the Audiobook Network. So really go anywhere that you usually get your audiobooks and you'll find it, like Audible and iTunes and Amazon. Janelle, it's been really wonderful talking with you tonight. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Larry Lee Hagan Jr.'s new book, titled Lessons from God, it's a transformative spiritual guide. And I'm going to be finding out all about this. The author Larry is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Larry, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Can you tell me all about Lessons from God and what readers are going to find when they open this up? Well... It's something the Lord just led me to do. It's unbelievable how it happened. But one of the things he put on my heart is I've had so many people come up to me and ask my advice on situations. And there are people that have been in the pews 20, 30, 40 years. And the first thing I ask them is, well, what did God tell you? And they'll say, well, I don't know that I hear God or I don't know if it's him or it's just my conscience or if it's him or something in my head. And people don't realize the importance of hearing his voice. So I began the book by sharing the testimonies of the times the Holy Spirit showed me things and the incredible things that he did through them. This is the first time I've ever written a book, so this is all new to me. Wow, congratulations. How long were you working on it once you got started? From the day he asked me to do it, six months. I had two months worth of technical issues, but... Yeah, about six months it was completed. I haven't written a thing since I got a high school 40 years ago, except the songs God's had me write. And I've written 40, 50 songs, sing them in church. But that's the only thing I can compare it to because I just get along with God. Each chapter lesson in this book is exactly the same thing. I use these testimonies to accent the points that I felt him leading me to make. Each testimony fits in with the lesson. And what gave you this idea? What sparked you to get started on it? Exactly what we're talking about here in the Lord's voice. He asked me to do this, and I prayed. I said, well, what should it be about? I had no idea. And he brought to my mind a memory of my daughter coming to me and asking me, and she said, Dad, one day you're not going to be around to tell us the stories. Now, we call them testimonies. Our kids just call them stories. She said, would you write them down for me so that I have them when you're gone? And I never got to that until he asked me to write the book, and that was the direction he gave me. So I shared the testimonies. And then later throughout the book, there are things we can do to get closer to God where we can hear his voice. And those are the things I share with people. So I could only imagine what you were thinking and feeling whenever you finally got to hold Lessons from God in your hand. That physical copy is finally there. Uh, what was that like for you, Larry? Oh, man. It's crazy that all these things that God's been speaking to you about and putting in your heart and directing you to write, and you go through this process with the editing and everything, and when you finally hold your book, you're holding something tangible. It's not thoughts anymore. You know, it's actually something physical that you're holding on to, and you realize this will be here long after I'm gone, and that's there for my children, my grandchildren, and any that come afterward. Once you got started on the publishing process, Larry, what was the most challenging part of that for you? Well, I'll tell you what. Thank the Lord for spell check. <laughs> <laughs> because it's one of those things that I've never been any good at, you know. I mean, comprehension, fine, but I've got dyslexia. I can look at a word like ready. I know it's right, but it doesn't look right. And so my spelling's always been ridiculous. And when I realized I didn't have to worry about that anymore because of the computer, it made it a lot easier. It really did. So what are the chances that we might see another one from you here in the future, Larry? Have you given thought to more? Actually, I have the concepts, probably half of a book, that go along with the style of this first one. And there's another one I'm working on that I really don't feel it's time to go into right now. Well, now it's official. You're a published author. Your stuff's out there for the world, Larry. When you think about that, 
What's the most rewarding thing of it for you? That I obey God. Personally, spiritually, for me, I mean, I love him more than anyone. To know when so many times in my life I've got it wrong, that this time I got it right. Again, the title is Lessons from God. It's written by Larry Lee Hagan, Jr., and published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can get it everywhere, really, at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Larry, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about your work. It was great talking tonight. God bless you, brother. It's been great. I enjoyed it, too. The book that I'm looking at right now is a heartwarming story for young readers, and it's titled Grandma's Special Cookie Cutters. It's written by Bonnie Benson, and we're going to talk all about this. Bonnie is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Welcome to the show, Bonnie. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, Bonnie, can you tell me all about Grandma's Special Cookie Cutters and what readers are going to find when they open this up? Oh, they're going to find three young girls, and they're going to surprise their parents by having a last-minute bake sale. Well, it's not really last-minute because they knew about it, but they forgot to tell their parents. It's for a school carnival, and they're going to have to bake these cookies for the carnival, which is the next day and parents have to work and they're going to have to get a babysitter to help bake these cookies and if things get out of hand with their little dog chewing up the existing cookie cutters and they're going to have to go and dig up grandma's special cookie cutters that one of the little girls that main character Dawn finds that she knows that are up in a trunk up in the one of the spare rooms that were her grandma's. And so she'll go up and get those cookie cutters, and they'll use those to make the cookies. It reflects back in the time when kids would go and have pajama parties and do these kind of things when they were, you know, I don't know if they still do that or not, but that's something I used to do when I was younger, and my daughter did too, so. This is a book for young readers. Bonnie, how young do you think? Oh, I would say probably about seven, eight, nine years old. Probably, maybe a little bit older. And what gave you this idea? What sparked you to get started on it? Well, I like to bake. I like to have my daughter help me bake. And I was just thinking how neat using cookie cutters and reflecting back on something. Well, I use a lot of stuff that my mother taught me. Well, I was just thinking back that something through the generations that would be special to me that another little child would think about that would be special to them. So I just tried to reflect, find something that another child would think about. And I thought a cookie cutter would be something that they could use that was their grandma's and they could use that to make cookies with. So that's about the only thing I could think of that could be passed down, you know, with little girls because I have a daughter, so I don't know that much about boys. <laughs> So once you got started on Grandma's Special Cookie Cutters, how long of a journey were you on, clear up through publishing and everything? Oh, from the time I started until publishing, it took almost about, well, probably close to a year. And something that's super important, especially when it comes to books for children, is the illustrations. How difficult, Bonnie, was that for you to get those illustrations lined up the way that you had it in your head? The publisher was marvelous. Mm. Hawk and Jenkins got it down perfect, especially the dog fancy, because I based it on our dog, Peanut, and all I did was send them a picture. They got it perfect. They got the girls perfect, because I based it on my daughter and her friends. And I mean, everything was perfect. They did an excellent job. And what was it like for you when you finally got to hold Grandma's Special Cookie Cutters? That finished product, your first copy came in, and it was a real thing. What was going through your head, Bonnie? Oh, it was exciting. I mean, I looked at it, and first I didn't want to look at it. My daughter looked at it. <laughs> and I looked at it, and I thought, in my mind, it was perfect. Just like I visualized it. The characters, the dog, the cookies, everything. Just the whimsy of it all came through. It all came through, and it all came together, and it was all in that book, and it I reached my objective. Well, I think young readers are really going to love this book. Again, it's titled Grandma's Special Cookie Cutters, 
It's written by Bonnie Benson and published by Haas and Jenkins Publishing, so you can find it everywhere. Head over to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores. You'll be able to grab it up. Bonnie, thank you again for joining me and tell me all about Grandma's special cookie cutters. It was really nice talking. Well, it was really nice talking to you, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. The audiobook edition of Dorothy A. Campbell's book, Pearl, A Journey of a Lifetime, is out now. And we're going to be talking all about that. The author, Dorothy, is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Dorothy, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you being here with me. Thank you. Dorothy, can you tell me all about Pearl, A Journey of a Lifetime, and what readers and audiobook listeners are going to find here? This book is about a scam. The card artist steal from you by sneaking through your emotions instead of through your window. This book will explore a brief history of how I encountered scamming for the first time. You will travel with me and the con artists until they set me up for the kill. You will also experience how I took them home in the presence of my four young children. Under the spell of the con artist, I placed myself and my family in a dangerous situation. Read this book and witness the strategy I use to escape from my captives. Dorothy, what's your target audience with this book? Well, I would say 18 to 54. And how did you get the idea for this, Dorothy, to write this story? I got the idea from a girlfriend of mine. She knew that I was interested in writing. And so New Year's 2012, if I'm not mistaken, she called me to wish me a happy New Year. And we talked for about two hours. And she encouraged me to write the book. Have you ever done anything like this before, writing and publishing-wise? Well... No, I have not, but I had the idea of doing it because I originally I wanted to write an autobiography and I was collecting the information for a couple of years. And so I started doing the autobiography and one morning I just I went to my computer and I said, Oh, an autobiography, not only are you discussing your life, you discuss your family life and the people you know life. And I said, I don't think this is good. And so I erased all the information I had on the computer. And then I sat down and I felt sorry for myself that I was able to do this. So then I said, I'll write a book. And the book will be like an autobiography. It's going to be generational. And it'll be like an autobiography. And that's when I really got the idea. Once you got started writing, Pearl, how long of a journey was that for you? How long did it take you? It took me a couple of years, about two years. And after that hard work, everything that went into this book, Dorothy, what was it like when you finally got to hold it, when that finished product was ready and it's in your hands? What was that like? Oh, I, I really felt good. I felt real good. I felt proud of myself. I felt I accomplished something and everything like that. That was the general feeling. And when you think to yourself, hey, I'm a published author, my work is out there for the world, uh, what's the most rewarding thing to you about that? It was rewarding because I just feel that if I could do it, it almost anybody can do it, you know? Mm. All you have to do is take an interest in yourself and what you're doing and, and do it. Was it difficult for you to find just the right voice that you wanted for this? Well, no, not really. I just felt that if the voice sound a little bit like me, you know, mm. it'll be okay. Now, looking ahead, do you have more writing, more books planned? Well, I have a book in progress that I feel that's going to be better than it happened in Manhattan. When you're writing, is writer's block, anything like that, ever something you have to deal with? No, not really. I don't have a problem with that. Again, this audiobook is titled Pearl, A Journey of a Lifetime. This is written by Dorothy A. Campbell, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So go to the places you normally go to get your audiobooks, and you'll be able to find it, like Audible, iTunes, and Amazon. Uh, Dorothy, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking to me all about Pearl. It was a great time talking. Thank you. 
We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. 